their gift to Wisconsin. It is a mean-minded and thuggish parallel performance by Scott Walker. Now what does Scott Walker's budget do? It guts aid to localities, it guts support for education, it guts the ability of workers to even have a say about how they're going to be treated in the workplace and at the bargaining table. But Walker said, oh, I'm sorry, but I have no choice because the budget is in such dire straits. But there is another choice. Last month, I asked several state legislators to check with the Legislative Fiscal Bureau and give me the answer to one question. How have Wisconsin income tax rates changed since the day that I left the legislature to go to Congress in 1969? And here's the answer. Since that time, the bottom rate has increased by 70%. The top rate for people who make over 210 grand a year has been cut by 22%. If the only thing the governor did was to return that top rate to its 1969 level, that action would raise $600 million, cutting in half the cuts that the governor has been laying on education. Because with him the issue isn't uh, the, the issue isn't money. It is an intentional and purposeful assault on the moral underpinnings of enlightened capitalism and an assault on democracy itself. Just one example. The Republicans claim that the voter ID bill passed by the state senate last week was necessary to avoid voter fraud is spectacularly more fraudulent than any voter conduct is meant to inhibit. <laughs> rooted in a desire for partisan gain on the most basic right of a citizen in a democracy, the right to have his or her vote counted. It is a thuggish, disgraceful, and shameful act that we're witnessing. problems at the state and the national level. Why is all of this happening? Well, let me tell you why I think it's happening. Before Franklin Roosevelt came along and saved capitalism by the intelligent use of government in the 30s, the national government was largely used as a tool to help expand the country westward and to assist business. When FDR took over, he widened the deal. He used the tool of government to provide working class families with stronger wages, improved working conditions, and a retirement safety net by creating Social Security and by guaranteeing workers a seat at the bargaining table. Because of those changes, working families' share of national prosperity steadily expanded, and the huge gap between the economic elite and everyone else steadily diminished. Those actions produced the golden age in American economic history, but the economic elite hated them, and they called Roosevelt a traitor to his class. And when Dwight Eisenhower was elected, key segments of that economic elite were hoping to see the New Deal reversed, but Eisenhower was a wise and solid man, and he said, no way, those are settled questions. And so the hard right worked for years take over the Republican Party after Eisenhower left the scene. And with the candidacy of Barry Goldwater in 1964, they finally succeeded. But as you know, he was crushed by Lyndon Johnson in that election. So then the economic elite, the Scafies, the Bradleys, and the Cokes, and others began to pour a steady stream of money into developing right-wing think tanks, which could be used to produce papers, hold conferences, and it excerpt changed public attitudes on economic issues. In the last election, they won a huge number of congressional seats, and they think that this is their time to repeal the New Deal and shrink the social contract, no matter how deeply that effort 
would divide the country. And I have to tell you, what really gets under my skin is that many of them would have us walk away from our social responsibility to each other, simultaneously shout the loudest about God and Christian values.